This is Global Health, and I'm Gail Fraser. This topic today is Unit 11, and we're going to be talking about non-communicable disease. And of course, our focus will be on something that you can actually do something about. It's smoking cessation. The non-communicable disease, or NCD, topics today are prevention of the diseases, public health professional profiles related to non-communicable disease, so that would be focusing on heart disease and other types of preventive measures, as well as a case study about smoking cessation. And I think that one of the things that um, we mustn't overlook is the huge benefit that would occur if globally there were far fewer smokers. And since I work in the Middle East, I'm particularly sensitive to this issue because the, the number of young people, especially young men, who smoke here because tobacco products are so inexpensive here and they tend to be black marketed through the Middle East and so these young men get addicted to tobacco and it's really part of the culture uh, and so more and more people here in the Middle East are succumbing to non-communicable diseases related to smoking. So non-communicable diseases are mainly cardiovascular disease. So it could be exposure to, in the workplace, to dust, particulates, and again, smoke, cancers. Of course, lung cancer is a consequence of smoking, but also exposure to sun and other types of cancers. Diabetes, chronic lung disease, are all parts of non-communicable diseases. So there's a variety of things that uh, the number one killers, think of them. Number one, cardiovascular disease. Number two is cancer. So these are the number one killers in the developed countries, not in developing world, but in developed countries. They're currently, they're the leading cause of death worldwide. In 2010, 57 million deaths were attributed to uh, the, the non-communicable disease. Two-thirds of them were non-communicable disease. So most non-communicable conditions are preventable. Let's repeat that. Most non-communicable diseases are preventable and it all relates to lifestyle, different things that are uh, very hard for people to change, but we need to reduce our behavior risk factors. So reducing tobacco use, getting more exercise, having a healthy diet, and then harmful use of alcohol and illicit drugs. That's another one that's completely and absolutely preventable. Keep in mind, um, when you're looking at physicians out there, especially in Colombia, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, more doctors actually smoke, and so they don't necessarily give such good advice about smoking cessation. Smoking's increasing, and it's, uh, that's what's really sad, is that you think, okay, we all know we need to have good exercise and healthy diet, but people are still continuing to smoke. And there's a map here, and it's showing that Latin America, there are 96 million smokers. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, again, because of the trafficking of black market cigarettes, that's another area, and then China. China, there's a lot of, um, uh, continue, men has, in particular are continuing to smoke. So there's a total of, it says, 2,390 200, million people uh, that actually smoke. And those are not even that new uh, statistics. The Action Plan for Global St Strategy for Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases has key components. So again, there's a global strategy, and this is through the United Nations World um, Health Organization or Pan American Health Organization. And there's a lot, a lot of good that can be done by something that's relatively straightforward, prevention of smoking, especially during pregnancy. So they recommend surveillance, prevention, and preventive health service. So it's a, there's a combination there. It's a public health strategy. Surveillance aims to monitor the incidence, meaning the new cases of non-communicable disease, analyze the non-communicable disease social 
economic and behavioral determinants. So again, trying to think about ways of preventing smoking or other uh, high-risk behaviors. Provide guidance and policy, legislation, assessment of future changes of strategies. So, for example, in the Middle East and a lot of places in developing uh, in developed countries, so uh, parts of Europe, United States, Canada, more and more uh, public buildings are saying no smoking allowed. I think you're seeing that in Colombia as well. And uh, so there are ways of preventing pollution in the in the air so that uh, cars and industries are uh, allowed to produce a lot less smoke. So there are environmental controls that are also occurring to prevent um, the strategies. Uh, exposure to sun. Uh, Australia was the very first to come up with the slip, slap, slop. You slip on a hat, you slop on the sunscreen. So there are different things that you cover up to avoid exposure to sun, and that's another skin cancer is a preventable, non-communicable disease. Cardiovascular disease could be prevented by lifestyle changes, but I'm afraid that I'm just as guilty as the next person about not really getting as much, uh, having a, as active a lifestyle as I should. Again, in the Middle East, very often the temperatures outside are 50 C. So it's very hot, so people are less inclined to exercise outside. But fortunately, we have gyms and different types of pool activities, indoor pools that have Actually, the swimming pools here have chillers to keep the water cold enough um, so that we can encourage to have healthy amount of exercise, healthy diet, smoking cessation. I know that many of you uh, know people that smoke and uh, it would be, you know, there must be a strategy for encouraging them to stop smoking. <laughs> Epidemic of non-communicable disease, again, smoking bans. Uh, it's a bad habit to break. You can see that it's not easy for people who've tried smoking. Almost everyone has. They have international health smoking bans. So you can see in Kenya, Egypt, that must be a hard one to enforce. Different parts of Europe, Canada, US. Uruguay is the only one that's listed in Latin America. Of course, Australia. And I know that uh, Indonesia smoking statistics are tremendous and I wanted to be able to show you this video so let's look at our smokers in Indonesia. In the western world there's been a huge crackdown on tobacco here in Australia of course we're about to see the start of plain packaging while big tobacco's market shrinks here and elsewhere it's refocusing its sales efforts on developing countries like Indonesia the result is a massive increase in smoking rates, including among children. Indonesia correspondent Matt Brown reports on the plight of one little boy who's found it impossible to kick the habit. Hadi Ilham is just eight years old, but he's already been smoking for four years. I'm just wanting cigarettes. Just wanting them. While this is undoubtedly a shocking sight, it's also disturbingly common in Indonesia, which has around 5 million child smokers. Indonesia faces a public health tragedy from smoking that's probably as great or greater as any nation in the world. With so many children starting, they're facing a true epidemic. Ilham lives in the little village of Karawangira, about 120 kilometers south of Jakarta. Parents here are often ignorant about basic child health, well-being and discipline. Against that backdrop, the tobacco industry is selling a health hazard so ubiquitous it's almost impossible for kids to avoid. Where did you get the cigarettes? From the people. They sometimes give me cigarettes. There's no other country where a third of all kids test try a cigarette before the age of 10. And in Indonesia, where over 60% of men smoke, over 80% of them started as a child. Ilham's addiction has taken him on an extraordinary and traumatic journey. It began when his father sent him to the local shop to fetch a packet of cigarettes. Pretty soon, Ilham was buying them in secret for himself. 
When his parents cut off his pocket money, he resorted to stealing to fund his habit. Dan seandainya kita nggak punya uang, when we didn't give him money and he found rice at home, he'd go selling the rice. Anything he could sell in the house, he would sell. <coughs> His parents didn't know how to discipline their own son. They were no match for his craving for nicotine. Hey, hey, hey. Adilhan became an angry, overstimulated little boy. Sadi, then I feel sad, regretful, and ashamed that I could not educate my child. Adilhan will smoke anything he can get his hands on, but his favourite brand is U Mild, owned by the global tobacco giant Philip Morris. What ads do you remember seeing? Ones like U Mild, Super. Do you know who made them? I don't know. Ilham's parents say his plight is proof the industry targets children and must be reined in. If I see people installing cigarette ads around here now, I say to them, "Dude, stop putting that here." Look what you've done to my son. My boy is a victim of the cigarette companies. Don't you care at all about him? Indonesia is a reflection of what happens when you allow the tobacco industry to do whatever they want to make their products appealing to children, and you do virtually nothing to educate your population. When Ilham was featured on local TV in March, a national children's charity invited his family to join a rehabilitation program in Jakarta. What I want to achieve is to bring back the real children's world. Ilham needs to enjoy his playtime. He's got a right to go to school and a right to be healthy. After a month in rehab, Ilham was released, but little had been achieved. It was not a happy homecoming, and Ilham's ordeal was about to take another terrible twist. His parents were devastated when Ilham ran away from home. It was three weeks before Ilham was found, trying to steal from a mosque donation box 300 kilometers away. I feel disappointed that I couldn't take care of my own child perfectly. Now he even has a new weapon. He says, if you don't give me cigarettes, I will run away again. As a parent, I now fear of losing him once more. It's well known that the industry turned to places like Indonesia as regulations tightened up in the developed world. But the statistics on child smoking paint a truly damning picture. Over the last 20 years or so, the rate of children smoking in the U.S. has halved, and in Australia, it's fallen even more. But in Indonesia, it's tripled in less than 10 years. The national children's charity says big tobacco and the government are equally to blame, and it's planning to sue both, using Ilham as one of its case studies. I cried because children became victims of a greedy state which fails to protect public health and a greedy cigarette industry which is only focused on making profits. Indonesia is the only country in Southeast Asia which hasn't signed the International Convention on Tobacco Control. Draft new laws being prepared right now are much weaker than the convention requires. But the industry and its supporters, like opposition MP Hendrawan Supratikno, are fighting even those. I consider it economic terrorism. Because, you know, this industry has contributed a lot for the country, okay? The industry's lobbyists have already succeeded in weakening the draft laws, cutting health warnings from 50% down to 40% of a pack. And a plan to limit billboards to 16 square metres was blown out to allow 72 square metres. And that would make something like this look positively modest. <laughs> Neither Philip Morris nor the industry lobby group would be interviewed for this program. But they insist they do not target children. And it's not their fault that most of their new customers get the taste when they're too young to know what's good for them. Okay, welcome back. 
This is Unit 11, Part 2, and we're talking about non-communicable disease and its impact on global health. The World Health Organization smoking statistics show that there are 1.1 billion, not million, billion smokers worldwide, and a third of those are young people, so adolescents 15 and over. Cigarette smoking kills nearly half a million people every year, making it the most lethal, more lethal than HIV AIDS, automobile accidents, homicides, suicides, overdoses, and fire combined. So you can see that this is why I'm emphasizing smoking cessation is actually a huge public health problem and it is something that we know a lot about to try to, to uh, prevent. Again, epidemic of non-communicable disease related to young teens or even kids that are under eight years old, as we saw in the video about from Indonesia, 100,000 children worldwide start smoking every day. So again, they're experimenting, and if we have behavioral uh, recommendations in place, maybe, just maybe, they'll be fewer. A 2010 survey found that nearly 80% of the advertising executives believe that cigarette smoking, the advertising, doesn't appeal to children. Yet, this is the type of thing that you're seeing worldwide, especially in China and other parts of Asia. Through advertising, tobacco firms try to link smoking with athletic prowess, sexual attractiveness, success, adult sophistication. I know that as a child when growing up that they were you know candy cigarettes even so we could mimic our parents who were smokers and so I remember having those as a, as a girl and hopefully maybe the young people in this uh, course maybe you haven't been exposed to those but they used to make candy cigarettes that looked just like cigarettes so you could pretend like you were smoking so you felt very adult in doing that. So let's just take a moment to look at the negative physical effects of smoking. I think that this is such a tragedy, especially young women. You, you think you're being independent, more adult-like, and uh, you may be carrying an unborn child, and that is the impact. That, that's, that's your hand. The premature birth of a child is, is uh, something that we would not welcome that the children have much, much bigger struggle to survive and have continuous health problems throughout their uh, young adult uh, maturity. So again, neonatals are put at risk and many young women that are uh, married young, they actually don't realize that they're pregnant until maybe three or four months and it has a very huge negative impact I know that is when I, I actually used to smoke, and so you can see I'm uh, an advocate for quitting smoking. I stopped smoking as soon as I found out I was pregnant with my first child. So these are, I'm not saying that, uh, I realize that there are a lot of difficulties in facing people that if you have to try to stop smoking. So young people, smoking is a very serious problem. Preventive health reports so that the smokers are higher at risk of heart attack and stroke. So these are from the World Health Organization uh, statistics. Let's just watch real quickly this video. It's a short one. Let's see. Destiny. At 12, I smoked my first cigarette. At 15, I was addicted. By 40, I'll have lung disease. At 15. I'll die of a heart attack. Cigarette smoke causes immediate damage. It leads to health problems, even death. Those who quit or die are being replaced by a new generation of smokers. I'm Dr. Regina Benjamin, United States Surgeon General. Go to CDC.gov. Learn how to make our next generation tobacco-free. So that's one of the public health challenges for all of us and something that many of us could do something about. Tobacco use, it, when you look at risk factors, you can see they've got number one is the heart disease. And then number two here, 
quite a bit lower risk, but still very high risk, is for stroke, so cerebrovascular disease, respiratory problems, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So these are all related to smoking, and you can see how it makes up a very high majority of the total deaths worldwide. Smoking statistics also include the it's highest among people 9 to 11 years uh, of education or less, so people that haven't finished secondary education or high school. Smoking is lowest among people who have higher education, so if you finished your bachelor's degree, that the smoking is lowest among that group because you also have a better understanding of many things. Approximately four, almost 45 million adults are former smokers, so I'm among those and that they have 25 million men who have quit smoking. So that might be an encouragement to people that there are 45 million people who have actually quit smoking now that they understand better the health consequences. Here again are two-thirds of the world smokers live in 10 countries. So you can see that China, Indonesia, India, Russia, and then of course we've got a good number in the United States and far fewer in these other countries in Europe. The National Institutes of Health, or NIH, uh, and the Institute of Medicine, IOM, they have reports uh, periodically, and it says that uh, 15 billion cigarettes are sold daily. So that's a lot of cigarettes. Reports declare the use of tobacco as a global menace, and in many countries, the work environments are smoke-free. So again, we're moving, but gradually, slowly. Again, in the Middle East where I work, uh, you can see that the, the hookah or the shisha uh, tobacco smoking is a part of the culture. And it's much, much harder to uh, make people aware that this is actually very, very unhealthy. It's like smoking a whole pack of 20 cigarettes all at once. So the impact is tremendous. Sometimes uh, men will sit in you know, you, you're walking down the street uh, for some exercise. I know I go out most evenings, and you'll smell that fragrant smell. They make the tobacco fruit flavored. Uh, you know, you smell cherry, you smell peach, and they make it all very appealing to young people. But to stop smoking for a better tomorrow, you can see that tobacco has a lot of different things. It's got rocket fuel, which is part of methanol. It's got arsenic, methane, acetic acid, butane. So these are all very toxic things that you're putting into your lungs. Uh, in addition to the cadmium, toluene, alum, uh, ammonium, and of course the nicotine that you are seeking by smoking cigarettes. International, again, the impact on trying to get youth to stop smoking is one of the things that could be one of the initiatives that you could be interested in doing on campus, say, because I imagine that there are still young people who smoke in Colombia. So after 20 minutes, these are the different things. 20 minutes after smoking, your heart rate drops. You have 12 hours after quitting, your carbon monoxide comes more normal. In two to three months after you've quit smoking, your risk of heart attack immediately drop. So you can see your lung function improves, so 20 minutes and on. So you, these are encouraging things. So nine months after quitting, your coughing stops, and then five months, even your risk of stroke, five, sorry, five years after quitting, your risk of stroke is back to what it would have been if you hadn't been a smoker. So these are imp important, encouraging things. that You could tell people that the your body has a remarkable ability to restore itself if it's given better uh, healthy living style. I want to introduce to you a global health champion. This is a colleague of mine. His name is Mumtaz Wasip. And I think that one of the things that about that's specifically exceptional about him, he was the head of the National Institutes of Health Cardiovascular Health Section. And that's a remarkable accomplishment uh, he's originally from Egypt, and I think that he was very, very acutely aware of the, as I mentioned, the Middle Eastern culture of shisha or hookah pipe uh, smoking, uh, the, the impact of tobacco smoke on your cardiovascular health, 
and he has done many, many publications. He's recently retired, but he has volunteered to be a global health champion. If you want to Skype call him, he lives in Washington, D.C., so he's on the same time zone as you. Again, he was an expert in cardiovascular health, uh, led medically related research about the prevention of cardiovascular disease, and he's well published. So you just uh, Google his name. He and his wife both are um, researchers within NIH. I also want to introduce you to my colleague. She's actually from Nigeria originally, Adenike Ajani. She now is practicing public health medicine in Canada. She and her husband immigrated there with their family uh, two years ago. I was one of her support uh, for reference because she is a totally exceptional global health champion. She was the head of my non-communicable disease section when I worked in Doha, Qatar, and a remarkable, energetic person who really was creative in trying to use the few staff that she had in order to prevent the smoking cessation is one of the big things, but trying to promote school health, healthy lifestyle. They were targeting young young people to start people off correctly because in addition to smoking, in the Middle East, they have a very high, twice as high as the world average of individuals with diabetes. So diabetes is a huge problem. Secondary onset diabetes due to lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle and uh, eating habits. So she was spearheading initiatives to help that. So let's go into our discussion summary. So non-communicable diseases are number one killer in developed countries. We mentioned that. Some developing countries have bipolar conditions where they have people that are quite uh, malnourished as well as obese and Colombia is in that condition where you have uh, the very affluent people that have uh, unhealthier lifestyle, they have too many things available to them and uh, very low uh, exercise, especially around children because again we have a lot of safety concerns um, within Colombia and so we have where you have obese children as well as very poor uh, malnourished children. Non-communicable diseases are primarily related to cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and they are, all of them, preventable by modification of your lifestyle. So we're looking for the next, the next solution. Again, the effective communication strategy will be changing. We're, our target is people your age, young, young adults or even adolescents who might be thinking about starting smoking. They've tried it. They're wondering if they'd like to continue. These are the types of things that only young people themselves can create the solutions for because you'll know what would be effective among your own uh, age group. So for our class discussion, we want to look at the global health challenges of preventing non-communicable disease. So you could look at diabetes, you could look at smoking cessation, you could look at different conditions, uh, cancer, and you could evaluate, say, uh, skin cancer prevention, the slip slop, slap, uh, strategy that they use in Australia. I want you to review the, the professional profiles and work activities uh, for dedicating your career to non-communicable disease. This is something that would be very useful in Colombia. And next steps you would recommend for the prevention strategies in Colombia for non-communicable disease. So much of the resources is spent on communicable disease and immunization, non-communicable disease is very important in Colombia. I will challenge you to get extra credit to watch this video. There's an optional video about smoking kills. It is actually quite a graphic video, but I challenge you to, to go ahead and watch it and give me a summary. It really, if you show that to your friends, they won't smoke. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's true. So smoking kills up to one person every uh, of every two users so you know 50% death rate is not something we would accept in any communicable disease but yet people still smoke thank you